My name is Leo Edwards and I'm a physician of internal medicine in San Antonio, Texas. I've been a physician since uh, actually 1978, uh, but been here in San Antonio since 1981. And I just wanted to take this opportunity to give more clarity on this whole thing with the Corona-19 virus and also the need for vaccination. The reason why I think it's so important is because of the fact that I've been in practice all these years and this pandemic thing is just unbelievable. Unbelievable, not in terms of just people in the hospital, but me personally, because of the fact that I have lost maybe 40 patients over the time period to this virus. And the last four or five months, I lost a husband and wife two days apart. I've lost folks that have been as, lo as young as 30 years old with this virus. And so it's been a real problem in terms of, of the patients and their emotions, uh, the fear of everyone, everyone in terms of, 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 of being afraid of this virus. And now recently, uh, there's fears and other things uh, about the vaccine and whether or not people will take the vaccine. And so I just felt that I needed to stop, take an opportunity to kind of explain what the virus is all about and also to uh, make it clear that it's so important for folks to take the opportunity to get vaccinated because it truly will make a difference. I have a, a lot of people that have fears about this whole process of having the, the disease process, but also with the vaccine. Some people have fears because of the issues in the past with the Tuskegee experiment, uh, because of the fact that this was a very tragic time in history where a, a group of gentlemen who had syphilis were deprived of the opportunity for treatment with penicillin. And this experiment didn't last a few weeks or a few months, it lasts decades. And they basically watched these men deteriorate with syphilis just to see experimentally what would happen to them. And all these gentlemen were black. And so it was a real tragedy in terms of them experimenting on black men like this when they had an opportunity for treatment. Uh, I grew up during the time period where we had to go and get our polio vaccine. Uh, and this was like in the 1950s, I think it was like 1954 and, or 55, somewhere around in that time period. And what happened is, is that polio was the thing like, not like what we're going through now, but it was still a devastating thing because so many people were having polio and the limitations as a consequence of this viral disease process that no one could see, but they could see the effect of. They didn't know exactly how you got it, uh, but they were just fearful of it. And this is not like a new phenomenon. They're not in the 1950s by itself. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was paralyzed, and they think that at the time period, maybe he had polio, or maybe he had a thing called Gillian Barre, but he was paralyzed. They thought at that time that he had polio. And so polio was something that was on people's minds about what can we do about management of this invisible disease process. And so what happens is it started work on trying to figure out what to do. And what happened is, is that with the work of Dr. Salk, they were able to find a vaccine, a thing that gave you immunity against this thing that would potentially cripple you. And the crippling was not just in the legs, it was crippling or weakness in the muscles of the chest where you couldn't breathe. And basically they had to place you in this machine to expand your chest and let it go down, expand it and let it go down. They called it the iron lung. It was a terrible disease process to have. And so with the vaccine, it basically eliminated polio from the face of the United States and potentially the, the world. Uh, at that particular time period. It's coming back because people don't believe in vaccines. They have the suspicion that vaccines will cause all these problems or, or they're just not sure. But the reality is, is that 
if they go back in time and look at what it did to people, they can appreciate the fact that it made life so much better for the general public. What I'd like to do is to talk to you about the coronavirus, the Corona-19 virus, but also I'd like to give you some history of coronaviruses in general because there's about seven different uh, groups of them that can infect humans, but three of them are really significant. One is the SARS, S-A-R-S, and that's a severe acute respiratory uh, system virus. That came out in about 2002. And basically what happens is, is that this coronavirus had the ability to come to your lungs and cause you problems with shortness of breath. And so, and it was a sudden onset of this problem. It, it basically caused a lot of concern, but what happens is, is that it kind of went away. Then in 2012, they had the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome of virus. That was another coronavirus. And that came out in 2012. That was a much more severe disease process because what happens is, is that the one in 2002 had a fatality rate around about 3%. This one, the, the Middle Eastern Respiratory, or the MERS virus, had the fatality rate of close to 40%. And so scientists were looking at these viruses and figuring out what can we do to kind of study this. This thing that was 40% fatality, they really looked at that very hard because if that came over here at 40% mortality, that would be catastrophic for this country. And so they began studying the one in 2002, 2012, and began the process of figuring out how this virus works. How does it be able to transmit itself? How does it infect individuals? And so with those pieces of information, they were able to kind of figure out how this coronavirus worked. Now, I forgot something to mention that coronavirus is a virus that has bumps on the surface. They, and they call it the corona because it looks like a crown. So going forward, what happened and when this thing came out in 2019, they had all of this information from 2002, 2012, now 2019, where this coronavirus, which now they knew how it worked, they were able to jump on it right away and try to figure out what can we do effectively to get a vaccine to take care of this pandemic. So basically they've had from 2002, 2019, which is 17 years of looking to understand this thing so that they can put it into practice when it came about for our present epidemic. Now, in terms of understanding, understanding how this thing works, I'm not going to go into details of trying to make it really complicated. I'm going to tell you that this virus, in and of itself, like MERS, M-E-R-S, the SARS, S-A-R-S, has a love for the lungs and the respiratory system. This is where it goes. Basically, it causes damage to your nose, your throat, your lungs, such that I can't smell, I can't taste, I may have a sore throat, I may have a cough. I may get some shortness of breath. The shortness of breath may get so bad that I need oxygen. It gets so bad that I have to have something over my face to make it so that it blows pressure on me to make me breathe better. Or in the worst possible scenario, it can get to my lungs and I have to be on a ventilator to breathe because it loves that type of tissue. Now, how does it get into that tissue? What happens to it? How does this thing work? Basically what happens is, is that this thing has this love for the tissue in the sense that it, it's kind of like this. The, the virus is, as they call the coronavirus, because of the fact that it has bumps on the surface. Those bumps on the surface make it so that they have different functions. One of the important functions of that bump is an attachment site to you. And so basically it's kind of like this. If you have a spaceship that takes off 
and basically gets into space and it wants to dock with the International Space Station, basically what happens is, is that they realize that they have to make that dock such that it fits right into the exact socket. It has to be the right size. But not only that, what happens here, it has to be a joining piece here in the middle so that when they join, the people in the rocket can move across this arm and get into the International Space Station. So it's very important for that docking situation to take place. The same thing with the virus. The virus has all these bumps on the head and basically those, those little bumps, which are a protein, have the ability to kind of fit into a socket within you, but it has to be a certain size and it has to lock up into a certain place for it to get to you and basically locks up. And then what happens is that virus has the ability to move into your body. Now, this virus that locks up and moves into your body is kind of like this. This is the shell of the virus, but it has the information on the inside. And that information is on the inside of the virus. And so basically when it locks into that space, then basically it dumps out that information and that information goes into your cell. I'm not the greatest artist in the world, but I just wanted to show you something or explain something to you. The messenger that is given by the virus, basically it gets into your body and goes to the cell. And once it, and the cell is like this, it's a big balloon. And that balloon has fluid in it. But then what happens is inside that balloon, you have the nucleus and also you have different things out here. And these particular things are things that are little factories that produce different things. Now, this messenger, instead of going to the nucleus, which, which would be a problem because of the fact that if it went to the nucleus, that goes to your DNA. And it, it gets inside your DNA and it makes more of itself using your DNA material. And so it affects your DNA. This virus does not go to your DNA. It comes out here. It goes to these factories. And basically it gets into the factory and then it tells the factory to make more of me, more of me, more of me. And then you get so many in there that basically it destroys the cell, pops open, and then it goes through another cell, then another cell, and then another cell. And that's how this thing works. It does not, does not go to your nucleus. So it doesn't affect your DNA. It doesn't affect your genetic material. It doesn't affect your ability to have kids or any effect on your DNA. So basically the material comes out of the virus and it empties it into your body, into the cell. And the cells that it likes are in your nose, your throat, and in your lungs. And basically that, base, that thing injects that, 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 that inside into you, into those cells, and basically it makes more of itself in your lungs, in your throat, and in your nose. And as it makes more of itself, it destroys that tissue. And that's why you have that sense of irritation. I can't smell anything. I can't taste anything. My throat feels irritated. Or my lungs get irritated. I can't breathe. Because it's destroying the tissue in that area as it makes more of itself. So the real danger of the virus is not the outside coat. It's this. The messenger. The messenger. And this messenger is made up of a material they call it RNA, which doesn't mean a whole lot in some ways, but from the scientist's point of view, it means a whole lot. Because from the scientist's point of view, because it's RNA, it does not go to the nucleus where your DNA is. It goes to the fluid portion of the cells where the factories are, where the factories are there, where it makes more and more RNA of itself. Now, as a scientist, what they found out is, is that if we know how this thing works, and the real problem is this, this messenger, what if we make an antibody against this messenger? What if we do that? 
And then if we make an antibody against this messenger, then if the virus infects me or gets on me and I make an antibody against it, it can't make more of itself. It cannot make more of itself in my body. So therefore, even if I have contact with the virus, it is not going to make me sick. It's not going to hurt my nose, my throat, my lungs, or anything because the messenger is not able to work. Now, these scientists who have studied this, this virus, this coronavirus type of things, whether or not you call it SARS or MERS or coronavirus 19, they know how it works. And basically what they did is, is that they know what is in this portion of it. They know exactly what's in the messenger. And what they've been able to do with that is reproduce this messenger, make more of the messenger. But what happens is they don't make the whole messenger. They say, look, what we'll do is break off the part that causes infection, but I leave enough other messenger that my body will recognize it as being foreign to me. And therefore, if I make antibodies against this, then this whole thing will not work in me. This is the whole principle by which they developed the, this, this uh, vaccine. They made an antibody against this portion of it so that it protects you. This is the whole idea. What, it, what has happened is, is that, and this is a, actually not something that came up as a consequence of this virus coming out in 2019. This is scientific air effort that has been ongoing since 2002. And so what has happened is, is that they were energized. They knew how it worked. They knew what they needed to do and they jumped on it. And so what happened is, is that Pfizer and Moderna basically created a situation where they took this, this messenger and basically they took a piece off and instead of injecting the messenger into you, they couldn't do that. What they found is, is that if they take the messenger, surround it with fat and put it in salt water, they can inject that into you. And basically once it gets into you, what you will do is make antibodies against this. And so as a consequence of that, your body has antibodies against the messenger. And when you have antibodies against the messenger, you won't get the sickness. That's what it's all about. The people at Moderna and the people at Pfizer figured out how to do it with the fat. And basically they had the patent on that. And they're the only ones that have that patent. Other companies are using the same messenger, but they have to figure out a different way of delivering it because they do not have the patent rights on that, that's, that cloud or that, that fat around it. And so Johnson & Johnson said, okay, we know what the messenger is. We got the piece that will give you immunity, but we can't put it directly into the body. How are we gonna do it at Johnson & Johnson? What they did was they took another virus and basically gutted it took all the guts out of it. And then what happens is they put it inside that other virus. And so when this other virus hits you, then basically what happens is, is that it presents your body with this. And this thing, this portion of the, of the RNA, the messenger, is enough to give you immunity. But instead of surrounding with fat, they put it in another virus. This virus won't hurt you, but it's a means of delivering the message to you. And by doing that, that also gives you immunity. Now, in terms of the immunity, they talk about the fact that it gives you a chance in which, like the Pfizer and the Moderna, has the ability to give 95% of the people with it, they will get immunity against the virus. 95%. When you take the flu shot, the best that you get is 70%. So with this, you get a 95% chance of not getting infected, not having a problem with it, not getting sick with it.
So it's a good thing for us. On the one from Johnson & Johnson, I heard recently that they got at least a 90% chance, which is still a whole lot better than 70%. And some of these products are only once, one shot as opposed to two. So it may be a good thing to have that as an alternative as well. But right now we're stuck with the two shot process because the first shot, the way they, they designed the study, when people got the first shot, they got about a 40 or 45% response. When they got the second shot, that's when they got up to 95%. So one shot will not be protective enough against this whole process to make it really and truly protective like we want it to be. So those are the, 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 the ways that this vaccine works. Now, in terms of how long does this immunity last? People were upset about the fact that how long is this going to be? Am I going to get a shot every three months, every six months, every this and that? Well, what happened is, is that initially they did not know. They did not know how long it would last. But what happened is, is that the people at Pfizer and Moderna and Johnson & Johnson, what they did is they did a series of testing on groups of people to see whether or not it would work, but also how long it would work. And so with Pfizer and Moderna, they covered about 72,000 people in their study. It's probably half and half. So 36,000 people got the vaccine. But those individuals that got the vaccine, that got that 95% immunity, they've been following them since that time period. And so that is our group that we're following to see how long the immunity lasts. And so that group, initially they said, oh, it lasts three months. And everybody's upset because, well, it doesn't last long enough. Well, they're still following these people. Then they're saying, oh, it looks like it's going to last six months. Now, as of last week, they're saying that this immunity will last at least one year because of that initial group that got the vaccine in the first place. They are the ones, the model in which we are following to see how long this thing lasts. Now, I want to say something about that model group. There are, I have patients that have asked me, and I've also seen things on TV that kind of really taints this whole process. Minorities are a large portion of the victims of this disease process, a huge portion. And as a consequence of that, a lot of people felt like they're not testing minorities enough to see whether or not it works well within them. And I want to give some clarity to that because I think it's very, very important. The people at Pfizer, the people at Moderna, they're scientists. They are scientists. They are statisticians. And basically they found that at the very beginning they could see that this thing had a love for folks that were Hispanic and black. And so in their initial study, they went out of their way to incorporate more Hispanics and Blacks in their study. Usually Blacks and Hispanics perhaps make up 2 to 3% of studies. But in this one, in Pfizer, minorities made up 30% of the participants. 16 or 17% of those were Black. In the Moderna study, Minorities made up, I think, 38% of the participants, not 1% or 2%, 38% of the participants. So basically, they were, went out and made sure that these people were covered. They were investigated. And not only investigated in terms of race, but also investigated in terms of disease processes, renal failure, diabetes, hypertension, uh, a myriad of disease processes were incorporated in these study groups to make sure that if we give this vaccine, it's going to work in this circumstance, that circumstance, that circumstance. And they did their homework. They made sure 
that they covered as many bases as possible. And so I, I, I applaud them for what they tried to do. Now the other portion of it is, is that I want to talk about the fact that this thing is safe. The majority of people that receive the vaccine have no major problems except for maybe soreness at the site of injection, maybe have some redness, maybe get some achiness. Some people have a fever for a day or so, then it goes away. If it stays longer, then something else is going on. But most of the people do really well. There's a certain group of people, however, that have a reaction to the injection right away. Right away. Not, not 30 minutes later, not an hour later, but right away. They get itchiness, they can get short of breath, they can have a myriad of things happen to them. And so basically, whenever individuals go and get their shot, that site always has what they call an EpiPen. So it's to cover what they call anaphylactic reactions, these sudden reactions. They give you the EpiPen and ordinarily, the shortness of breath, the itchiness, and the other problems go away. No one has died from the injection. Some people have problems with it, but what happens is they never die. Now, why do people have this reaction? The honest answer is they don't know. They don't know. They say that if you have an allergic reaction to the ingredients of this injection, then you shouldn't take it. But most of us don't know what the ingredients are. They don't know. Well, here's what the ingredients are. It's just the messenger RNA. They put the fat around it and salt water. That's it. They don't have any additives in it. They don't have anything in it to make it more active. They just got that. <coughs> and because of the fact that the reaction happens so quickly, a lot of people feel that the fat covering is something that some people have a problem with. And they feel that people that have multiple allergies to antibiotics, like I can't take penicillin, I can't take erythromycin, I can't take vancomycin, I can't take this, I can't take that. And it seems like from the doctor's point of view, it doesn't make any sense. But what happens is, is that perhaps the carrier that when they inject it into your body as the antibiotic, that carrier that may have some fat within it or phospholipid, is the thing that causes them to have these reactions. So if you have multiple reactions to antibiotics, or if you have reactions to some cosmetics that have fatty material, phospholipids in it, where you break out and all the other things, maybe you shouldn't take the, the vaccine. You know, or basically make sure they have an EpiPen just in case you don't have any choices but to take the vaccine. But but the majority of people do not have that reaction. So if I reacted to penicillin by itself, should I take the vaccine? Yes. If I have allergies to my nose or to my throat or whatever, should I take it? Yes. If I had never taken the flu shot, should I take it? Yes. If I had a reaction to the flu shot, talk to somebody, find out what that reaction is. Because the flu shot is different from this thing. The flu shot is a vaccine that's developed where they take the influenza virus, they grow it in egg-like products or whatever, and basically they kill it. They kill the virus, and then they grind it up, and then they put it in solution, and then they inject that ground-up stuff in you. And so if you have allergies to eggs or some of these other problems, maybe I'll have problems with this vaccine, with the, the flu vaccine. This one's entirely different. It ain't grown in eggs. It doesn't have all those other things. So you may not have a problem with this vaccine if you had problems with the influenza vaccine. So it is a, not so much a win-win situation, but it may be safer than what you think. So all in all, I think what happens to us is we are dealing with this pandemic. I'm wearing the mask to protect my brother because of the fact that I don't want him to get the disease process. I'm, I'm, and I want to say that the majority of patients that I have, they're basically doing the same thing.
They are wearing the mask. They are staying at home. They are isolating themselves from their kids, their grandkids. They don't go to the grocery stores. They have things delivered. Somebody comes to the door, they look at them through the window or all these other things. They have basically done well with this isolation. But what happens is, is that isolation is not the cure for this process. It is not. It's not enough to make this thing go away and provide everybody with the protection that they need. The only way that we can do this is by the vaccine. Because what happens is, is that if we use the vaccine and we inoculate 70 to 80% of the population, then basically what happens is we've reached a certain amount of folks where our level of worry begins to diminish significantly, significantly. If we do not, then we're going to be caught in the situation like the people that had the pandemic of 1918 and 1919. This pandemic lasted two years, maybe close to two and a half years, because they did not have a vaccine. These individuals are doing what we do. They isolated themselves. They did the cleanliness and all the other things. But what happened is, is that the virus still was killing people until it reached a clinical or critical mass. They said that at the time period, there were 150 million people in the world. And basically about 80% of the folks developed problems with this. And about, in terms of the 150 million people in the world, 50 million people died from this. 50 million people died. In this country, about 800,000 people died. We're right at that 400,000. 800,000 people died because of the fact that they tried to rely on social isolation and just cleanliness. Now what happened? Why didn't it work? What scientists have found out is that that virus that caused the problem in 1918, 1919, did not stay the same. It changed. It changed. It became more virulent or it infected people faster, younger. And what happened? What happened to make it like that? Well, what happens is what's happening now. When they're talking about these mutants, these strains on it, it's changing. The virus is changing. And as a consequence of that, it's causing more concerns. What is changing? As I talked to you before, I said that the virus itself has these little bumps all around the head, all around it. And these bumps are the attachments and makes it so that it can come into that space and land in and whatever's inside can get inside. Well, if the thing is too big, then it can't do it. But if it gets a little smaller, little smaller and that head comes a little smaller, then it can still get in that space. The link up is still the same. So it gets into that space a little bit easier and may cause more opportunity for the virus to get to get in. And so what do we do? The whole thing is here, the messenger. If we develop antibodies against the messenger, then we're protected. Now, how do we develop antibodies against the messenger? We do it by the vaccine. The vaccine is our way out, not waiting, not hiding behind the door, not waiting for it to go away by itself, because it's not going to do that. It's us. It's us making the decision that this is important. Now, the companies are a bit under the gun because of the fact that they have to produce enough for all of us. Some of them have to produce enough for all of us for two doses. Some have to do it for one dose. But what happens is, is that when they say that they're going to release a hundred million doses to this country, everybody says, oh, we're all covered. But a hundred million doses means that each state only gets two million doses. Each state only gets two million doses. And so what happens is the state of Texas gets 2 million doses. The state of Delaware gets 2 million doses. 
that means that a whole bunch of people in that state don't have an opportunity. So the government has to create a way for these companies to produce more and more of the vaccine. And they have to figure out a way of making it safely happen. And see, that's what our dilemma is. And so we have to understand that. We have to understand that the government and the companies have a problem because logistically it's going to be difficult. And the other side of the coin is, is that these companies are not just making it for us. They're making it for the world. They're trying to get the world out of this whole pandemic. So it is an unbelievable, tough task at this point in time. But what we have to do is understand it, push and push and push for all these folks, whatever they have to do to produce this vaccine to help us and make it so that we're okay, but also make the world okay. Because we can't get into a situation where the world has it and all these people die. We have to create a situation where they have an opportunity to have access to these things as well. So I hope that this explains to you why, how the virus works, why it's important to take the vaccine, and how long does it last. It's not that hard, and also I want you to understand that it's really, really quite safe. I wish you well. Thank you. I forgot to mention a couple of things uh, in the video, and I think it's very important that I add this on to it because patients have asked me questions, and I think these are very important questions to be answered. One is, if I had the COVID infection, or I had positive for COVID, or I had COVID pneumonia, should I take the vaccine? Yes, you should. The reason being is, is that if you had the positive test, no one knows exactly how long your immunity will last. Even if you had COVID pneumonia or had hospitalization, you probably had a bigger response to it and probably have more antibodies. But what they're feeling is, is that there's not enough studies on that to see how long that immunity will last. And so with the data that they have now from this, uh, the, the group that participated in the studies early, they find that these individuals, if they got the vaccine, their immunity would last at least one year. So individuals that had a positive test or had COVID still should take the vaccine. The other portion of it is, is that if I take the vaccine, why do I have to wear the mask? I want to take it off. I don't feel like I, I should wear it because I am immune. I should not have to wear the mask. The reality is, is that you're not wearing the mask for you. You are immune. You have, by receiving the vaccine, 95% of the people that get the vaccine are immune. They don't have any problems. They, it can hit you, but it doesn't infect you. But the problem is, is that the virus can get into your nose, your airway. It doesn't infect you. It doesn't bother you, but you can carry it. And as a consequence of that carrier situation, you can come into contact with somebody that does not have the blessing of your immunity. And you could give it to them, even though you feel like I'm strong, I'm ready, I got my immunity, but you could give it to them and they could get sick. Now, in terms of this whole approach, how do we know when this is gonna end for us? I was listening to a report and Dr. Fauci was saying that once we get to that point of 80% of the population having this level of protection of immunity, then what happens is our guard can go down. But it has to be 80% according to what he said on the news. That's a huge number. And to get to that point, we have to believe that the vaccine is important. The people that dealt with the polio vaccine and the past, basically they bought into that. And by buying into that, it eliminated polio basically in this country. It almost eliminated it. The virus is still here, but it's not infecting us because we have immunity. You know, so it's important. The people that feel like, well, they did, 
the experiments on black individuals in the past and basically we don't feel like we want to participate in it because of the fact that this is an experiment that may be deleterious or bad for us as black individuals. This is not true. This is not true. The problem that happened in the Tuskegee experiment was that they took these group of men that had syphilis and they did not give them treatment for it. And they watched these guys deteriorate. They watched them lose ground over these decades of time. This thing is different because what happens with this vaccine, what happens is the people involved with it that were involved in the initial study were multiracial groups of individuals. It had a big portion of blacks, a big portion of Hispanics in that study. And in that group of people that participated in that study, they achieved immunity, complete immunity, black, white, Hispanic, in 95% of the, of the individuals that participated. And so basically what happens is, is that instead of an experiment where you were deprived of an opportunity to get well, this is an experiment, but it's not really an experiment. It, it was a study that allowed people to get well, not deprive them of the opportunity of getting well. It uh, offers them an opportunity to get well, to be protected. So this is a powerful, really important thing for people to think about because the vaccine, the vaccine is our way out. And I just wanted to stress that to you during this additional portion of this segment. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate you listening. And I hope and pray that you all will kind of think about some of the things that were in this video so that you can kind of make a good decision about what to do. I think the best decision is to get the vaccine from the medical point of view, because what happens to us if we hide and stay in our shells and stay in our houses, this virus will not go away. It may not go away anyway, but at least we have immunity against it so that we will not get sick from it. We will not die from it. We will not develop long-term consequences of it. So this is the way that we should go. Thank you a lot.